Hi, I'm Brian Crombie, and we're going to be talking on The Brian Crombie Show. We're going to be talking about politics, arts, business, and social issues on The Brian Crombie Show on Canada One TV. Welcome to the Brian Crumb Show on Canada One TV. So today, Mark Borkowski has been in the mergers and acquisitions business for 35 years. He's the president, CEO, founder of Mercantile Mergers and Acquisitions. He's the guy that I know in Toronto that knows more, Canada, frankly, knows more about what's going on in the M&A sp space than anyone else. Mark, congratulations on 35 years. Thank you. Still here. Fantastic. That's Looking impressive. Looking forward for the next 35. I can imagine. Yes. You and I both are. Why not? For the next 35. Yes. So, you know, I wanted to have you on because there's a lot of people in Mississauga, a lot of people in Toronto that, um, that have got businesses and want to know how to sell them. Uh, and they're saying that one of the biggest challenges, interesting enough, in the next couple of years is going to be succession. That people, you know, have created a bunch of wealth, have created small businesses, medium-sized businesses, and then what do they do with it? Um, and, uh, you know, do they give it to their kids? Do they sell it to their employees? Do they sell it to a bank? Do they, you know, hire you? So let's talk about what you do if you've got a small or medium-sized business and uh, you want to, you know, realize some, uh, some cash out of it. You want to liquid, you know, you want to, you know, crystallize your money. There are thousands of businesses in the GTA. The majority never sell. Less than 50% of all businesses end up selling. Really? So what the other half, the other half just seem to go away or wind up. Every opportunity presents itself. There are a sea of buyers looking for private businesses. There is an incredible amount of money in the system looking to acquire small, medium, large businesses. The bigger, of course, the better. Unfortunately, most owners of small businesses do not connect with the ideal buyer. They'll have somebody approach them and make them a proposal, and it's a lousy proposal. Yeah. And they've given their business away. Because they're not in that business. They're in the business of selling their own products, not necessarily selling their business. Exactly. So they don't know where to start. It starts with evaluation. Evaluation takes about two to three hours. No cost, no obligation. Any size of business where somebody's contemplating a sale, I'm happy to speak with them. It starts with doing You can normal. do evaluation in two, three hours? You can, do, you can do a very simple snapshot, and I'll be within five. Why do all these people say they need due diligence of a month or two? That's once the business has been sort of agreed to, you do all the study of what, what, what's there. But you have to start with setting expectations. Okay. Are we on the same wavelength? I've probably conducted over 10,000 or more valuations in a simple Simple step. Seriously, 10,000. At least. I mean, Where's my calculator? 10,000 divided by 35? Sometimes, two, sometimes two, three day, a day yep. where you're spending two hours, financial statements are provided. We go through what's called the normalization of income. So we add all the income back. So somebody's got six cars on, on the payroll. Suddenly now we only need one. We add all that income back. Somebody's not paying themselves a salary. On a normal situation, it would have to be a salary for a CEO or a president. We come up with a normalized EBITDA number. What's EBITDA? E earnings before interest, taxes, and depreciation or amortization. So it's sort of like cash flow. Correct. Okay. So we come to a cash flow number and we take, in most businesses, a multiple of that cash flow. Smaller business might be three times, larger business might be four, five, six, seven, eight, and it goes beyond there. Right. How does that at a multiple compare to a cap rate that people would be familiar with for real estate or a P multiple, a price earnings multiple that might people might be familiar with from the stock market. Cap rates are exclusive to real estate. And by the way, real estate and selling businesses, anybody that engages a real estate agent to sell their businesses sold themselves very short. Why? It's a longer process. Professional sales in our business require a lot of research. We cast our net very far. So some small owner that owns a, a company that makes these cups will be approached by somebody. They don't have any other alternative. We will contact a very wide network of potential buyers. The worst thing these people do is they're approached by somebody who has no money, <laughs> no, no capital. The vast majority of people out there are what we call search funders. They're looking for, for a company. They have no capital. They're hoping to raise the capital or hoping that the vendor is going to is going to sell vendor, them the capital. Vendor take back money. A vendor take back note. 
and he's going to sell himself with his own, with his own money. There are people who are what, what are called independent sponsors. So they claim they have a backer. Generally speaking, we don't believe that. Majority of them are leveraged buyout buyers. They're, they're trying to buy with cheap debt. You, def, you finance the business, and in many cases, they'll structure something called an earnout. So they'll say, look, you're telling us the business is this, you want that, we need to bridge the gap, so we will pay you based on sharing of profit, sharing of a royalty, sharing of gross margin, but it's called if come. Right. A hundred buyers for every seller, there's probably only two of the hundred that really have the qualification. Seriously? Yes. Only two of a hundred are any good? The vast majority are looking, they're dreamers. They're looking to buy something with virtually nothing or very little. So you really got to set out a big, so big, you have wide to set net. Out a wide net. So yes, there's a substantial amount of money out there. Debt is very cheap. There are a lot of people looking for businesses, but again, the majority of them don't have the capital. And secondly, many owners don't have an understanding of the real value of their business. Mm -hmm. Most have an exaggerated value. So after they've spoken with me, some get very frustrated. Because you're telling them it's only worth three times uh, their earnings and they think it's worth 10 times their earnings. Correct. And it, the spreads are that wide. So we go through a very simple process to come up with a, a, a thumbnail valuation. If we're not on the same wavelength, you've got to go back and reconsider or go get other opinions. You're probably not for sale. Now, now let me, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a finance guy, I apologize. Yes. Uh, and I think in discount rates. Of course. Um, so if it's a three multiple, it would be a 33% discount. If it's a four multiple, it would be a 25% discount or a 25% cap rate if you think Correct. about real estate yes, terms. Exactly. Real estate. Um, which means that uh, for someone to pay three times the earnings, they're demanding a 33% return on their money, which is an outrageous return to get on their money. Why would it something only be worth three times? Because they're using equity. They're using their equity and, and whatever debt they've raised, that is a fair return for somebody putting up capital. So you're saying equity times. returns are in the 30s? Equity returns on average are about 25%. Really? 30 to 35% is pretty normal. Venture capitalists seek 40 to 50 Okay, but if, if you're buying a, a, a well-run company that's got a positive EBITDA, you're going to put some debt. It's not all going to be equity. Correct. And so what would be a typical amount of debt that you could put on a company? Today, people are looking at putting debt up to, to about 40 to 50 percent. And it's, it's available price. on the purchase price. So if you're buying it at four times, let's make it easy all for right. the math. Or pick a number, pick a number, two million, whatever. Okay, so, you're, so if it's four times EBITDA, you're going to put two times of that EBITDA in on debt and two times in equity. Correct. And the, and the debt's going to be what, 8 percent, 5 percent? Prime plus three, prime plus five. Okay. It depends on the amount of equity that you've pledged. Right. But some leveraged buyers today are looking at doing three times debt. Right. Which, you know, that then encumbers the business. Big so time. an owner who's selling his business well, a now has to be very comfortable that if he's got a vendor take back note, there's a ton of debt ahead of sitting him. ahead of him. And if he's got some sort of an earnout or performance clause, they're going to be servicing debt. Okay, so I, if I've got a, a medium-sized business here in Mississauga, yes, and I come to you, you're going to spend, uh, you said, uh, you know, a couple of hours, you're going to do a valuation, um, and you come to me and you say, Brian, your business is worth four times EBITDA. What do we do next? Well, four times this number that we've agreed to. Right. So that's your real normalized earnings. EBITDA. And so I've given you a multiple based on your industry. Right. It might be more than four. It might okay. be more than five. But now you say you got to go out to a hundred people. It easily. We cast our net very wide because we bring in all these people and, 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 and they're everywhere who don't have a lot of their own capital. Right. And, and so, so what do you, like, do you need a business plan? Do you need a brochure? Like, what do you, what do you, what do we produce? The, the buyer? Yeah. What are you going to help? Like, well, the, buy, the buyer is going to contact and say, I'm, I'm an expert. No, banker. sorry. Me, me and you as the seller. Okay. What are so, we going to produce? Are we going to produce a, a we have to produce, memorandum so done, or what? Of course. So we've done a valuation we've come to some sort of a general understanding that the business is worth X yep. and terms and conditions, the deal's going to look like this probably more than likely. Now to go to this wide network and to seek out the best buyers, strategic or investor, we have to put some sort of a package together. We start by putting a teaser. So it's a blind one or two page summary of everything about the business, right. financial summary, corporate summary. And it's, not recognizable for the most part, but there's a two-page. But it's two to tease you. 
It, That's why it's tease. called a Correct. teaser. It's called a teaser. Got it. So now, in our case, we buy data. So we spend $35,000 US to buy data from PitchBook. We have the names of every single company in every single sector, websites, email addresses. So if we're selling a company that makes these cups, the most logical buyer for people. this company are these people that make these cups. So we will do a search and we will probably come up with between five and 600 potential companies. We will sit with the client who says, I know that industry. I know about 110 of those guys don't want to talk to them. We, we, we narrow down the list. Now we contact. Suddenly, black magic. We get response. Okay. Out of the blue. This, all this response comes back from our teaser. At that point, we ask people to sign a non-disclosure document, confidentiality agreement. We screen them before, of course, we do that. Once they've signed the non-disclosure document, we provide them something that we call a SIM, a confidential information memorandum. Okay. It's a summary of all the financials, organization chart, description of the business. It can be very simple. For a larger business, it can be very detailed. It can be as short as three, four, five pages. Do people usually need audited financial statements? No. I mean, audited statements today are generally required for bank borrowing. Okay. So most companies will have a notice to reader, not acceptable, that means a simple compilation, or what's called a review engagement. So those are normal statements prepared by an accountant. So that's not included in the SIM. We do a summary. Once we've get past the point where somebody's come back and said, let's have some discussions, let's meet, let's talk, then we can share actual financial statements with them and provide more disclosure. And you get into the brass tacks of the negotiation. You get into brass tacks. Sounds good. Nobody meets employees till the very end. Okay. The ideal sale today has to be a share deal. Why? Every shareholder. No, let me interrupt All right, you. go ahead. We're gonna take a break for some messages and come back more and you can tell me about share deals versus asset deals. Right on. Sounds good. Thank We're you. talking to Mark Borkowski, the president and CEO, founder of Mercantile Mergers and Acquisitions. About mergers and acquisitions, particularly about selling your small and medium-sized company if you've got one, and or frankly, listening to this, probably you're, some of you are thinking about how you could buy one of these companies, because I think a lot of us you know, have that dream of becoming an entrepreneur and owning a small or medium-sized business. So stay with us, listen to these messages, come back in a minute, and we're going to talk more to Mark. And I'm going to ask him about uh, you know, how big this market is, because I think it's huge right now. Private equity people, venture capital people, and, uh, and a new thing that you and I want to talk about, ESOPs, uh, employee stock ownership plans. Stay with us. Do you want to start your own business in Canada? Is it your dream to own a gas station? Would you like to invest in a residential development? If yes, then you need to contact Mirza Zulfkar Chaudhry, one of the best residential and commercial brokers in the community, broker of Global West Reality Limited. Call him at 416-908-1575. We specialize in commercial and residential development. We just developed this SO gas station with Pizza Hut. If you are interested in any kind of development, commercial or residential, please contact us with full confidence. Mirza Zofkar Chaudhry, broker of Global West Reality. Phone number 416-908-1575. Hi, I'm Brian Crombie, and we're going to be talking on The Brian Crombie Show. We're going to be talking about politics, arts, business, and social issues on The Brian Crombie Show on Canada One TV. It is Mark Borkowski, who is the president, CEO, founder of Mercantile Mergers and Acquisitions. It's a Toronto-based firm. He's been uh, running it for 35 years in the M&A business, and, uh, and he's an expert at uh, buying and selling companies, particularly 
uh, medium-sized uh, companies. Uh, Mark, um, we were just talking about uh, share deals versus asset deals, and you were saying everyone wants a share deal. Why does everyone want a share deal? Everybody wants a share deal. If you're a company owner, every shareholder within that company is entitled to up to $850,000, technically tax-free. So if there are two shareholders, 850 times two, tax-free. So if the purchase value is a million dollars, within, within reason, that's a tax-free deal. It's an incentive for owners to reinvest money in other businesses. Right. Currently, the government, federal government, have been talking about getting rid of it because it's a very big deficit factor on the balance sheet of the, of the federal right. government. And, and you're saying if they sell an asset, they don't get the 850 they do. They get nothing. Really? So, and they're actually, the proceeds from an asset deal, and this is very important, the proceeds from an asset deal are taxed at the income level. So if they've made a million dollars, they're going to be taxed at 52%. Versus in a shared deal, the first 850 is tax For free. Shareholders, tax and then free. after that, it's at capital gains rate, tax Correct. rate? Correct. I mean, you've got to do a share deal. So buyers want to buy assets because they don't want any history. When you buy shares, you're buying all the employees' uh, history, their, their, their uh, severance obligations, if there are any. You're buying any potential stories of the back, lawsuits, whatever, but all is disclosed. So it's a share deal. In an asset deal, there's one other liability. Now you have to sever employees. You have to give them the opportunity to become day one employees now under the new owner. Right. The new owner buys the name, but he changes the name from corporation to incorporated. So now you've got to sever employees. What if you've had an employee for 25 years? 25 times two weeks? If he's a manager, 25 times a month. And if you're, if you're working with some of the law firms that are suing people for wrongful dismissal and severance, it could be three, up to three months. So your advice when you're selling is always sell the shares. Always. And if you're buying... Try to buy assets try to buy possible assets. because you're not buying any history. Is this an active market? Is there much the, money it, chasing these deals? It, it, it's exploding. I mean, there is not enough hours in the day. There's lots and lots of lots of money looking for all kinds of businesses. There's nothing to buy. So the private equity firms... Nothing if, to buy or just too much demand for what, what's available? There's a lot of demand, but there is very few opportunities of any consequence. Really? That's not a lot of, there might be a lot of franchises and smaller businesses, but as you get into businesses that earn more than a million dollars, you get into businesses that earn more than $500,000 of EBITDA profit, the competition is fierce. The institutional players, the private equity firms that manage the pension funds, the insurance funds, the endowments, they're out looking. Are institutions actually coming and buying companies that are only making 500 grand or a million bucks? There are small private equity firms in the US and Canada that will buy companies that are earning as a bare minimum, roughly $500,000. Really? Below that, there'll be, there'll be private investment groups. Okay. Just like people accumulate real estate, there are family offices that, that have accumulate a multitude of businesses. No different. Do you think that's a good strategy? Yes. Versus, versus my, you know, let's say I had some net worth versus me going out and buying a bunch of real estate, going out and buying five or six different companies. I mean, what are, what are rates of return in real estate? Give me a cap rate. 5%. Okay. Versus what's, a, what's an equity investor that's made a private equity investment? He's looking for 25 to 30% return on equity. You're running a, a living organism. Real estate is not living. I mean, it's there. You're running a business. 25 to 30% return on equity. Not bad. That's how people build what, net worth. What, what, what industries are, are attractive? Oh. Uh, industrial, biotech, uh, high tech? Biotech is soft. The real hot industries at the moment are very, very basic. Heating, ventilating, air conditioning. Really? Oh my God. Plumbing, electrical contracting, basic trades, basic industrials, manufacturing, high value added manufacturing, something where you've added something, not just you know moving one thing to another. Anything, anything in the insurance industry. So many people get into franchises and retailing. Good business. You're buying, not? you're buying a job with a franchise. Yep. I mean, at the end of the day, by the time you pay a franchise fee of seven to 10%, your, 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 your pre-tax profit might only be 14. So there's very little bottom line left there. So a lot of these franchises only make money with what they steal from the crash register. Not good, but, but that's but, the reality. What about, what about restaurants? 
Do we have to discuss restaurant? Probably the worst investment that anybody could ever make. It's at the very, very bottom of desired businesses. Although I used hundreds. to be, I used to be a hotel restaurant consultant. I and, know that. And, and people, I know that. That's why I, people used to say that uh, it's the second owner of a hotel that makes money. It's the third owner of a restaurant that makes money. It's actually today the fifth owner of the restaurant. Apparently, it's an awful business. You're working 16 hours a day. And, you know, and every Friday and Saturday night. Exactly. So those are not exactly very desired businesses. There are lots of restaurants so for sale. I, 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 uh, I chatted with a, a guy the other day that said that he thinks the biggest opportunity coming to Canada in the future, um, and uh, he said it based on his experience in, uh, in the United States, is ESOP, employee yes. stock ownership plan companies. And he was saying that, uh, that about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, the United States put in place a regulatory system that incentivized uh, uh, employee ownership of companies. Um, and uh, Boris Johnson, um, actually it wasn't, it was the Liberal Democrat, uh, uh, the Conservative Liberal Democrat uh, coalition that put in place uh, ESOPs in the UK, uh, and that they've taken off both in uh, the US and the UK. Um, billions of dollars, uh, trillions of dollars of investment, something like 6,000 businesses in the United States that are owned by, by employees. Um, is that something that makes any sense in Canada? It makes a ton of sense. The problem is the current government legislation, federally, doesn't allow it. All the tax advantages of the US, London, UK, significantly different. So there's not a lot of incentive for an owner to sell his company to his employees. Outside of some altruistic reasons possibly yes you know that he wants his employees to participate but for all intents and purposes it hasn't a great financial appeal it's not a great return yeah however people have been trying to do ESOPs here for at least 20 years and, and I've talked with all kinds of people to be very honest with you I've never successfully completed one and I don't know any of my colleagues who have really somehow through some organizational drive internally the owner himself may may consult with a lawyer or an expert, but they're not they're not many here. You won't hear of many. You'll hear of some employee-owned companies. I'm trying to think of some uh, some of the larger electrical contractor uh, organizations. Well, Ellis Don is employee. Ellis Don is the perfect example. Somehow they they managed to put a ESOP together. Yeah. Can you name more? Can you name any more? I can't. Um, not many. Isn't the company that bought out Heinz and Leamington? Um, is it French? Yes. Isn't that, yes. Uh, French. Frank. Okay, that's another very good example. But that's, at the moment, they have all kinds of employee problems, apparently, financing problems. So it's got to be spread so, out across. So the, re the biggest regulatory change that makes them attractive in the United States is the vendor, the current owner that correct. then vends it into an ESOP, in the U.S. doesn't pay any capital gains on a sale. That's exactly correct. Does, that so, doesn't apply here. So is, is that, do you think that makes sense for the government to make that regulatory change that, that incentivizes ESOPs by giving... Uh, vendors, no capital gains. I would do I would do two ESOPs every day if that were the case. The tax advantage is the reason people sell for tax purposes. You know, it's interesting because this guy that I was talking to said that uh, that the employees of companies that are um, employee owned are happier, stay with their jobs longer, they stay in the communities longer, they produce higher quality uh, goods because they're more invested in and Correct. committed to their company. And he said, if you're desire is to be you know to, to to make people more equal um he says the net worth of employees in an esop versus another company is five times higher not because they got given money but because over time the shares became valuable absolutely and they stayed long enough to crystallize that value and everybody everybody wins here's the bad news in the u.s or the, the good news in, in in the u.s the banks have an incentive to loan money to the individuals to buy out the owner. Remember, everyone's gonna to have to sign up at the bank. Not everybody can do that, but the banks will give people literally low interest rate loans, in many cases zero, subsidized by the US government to buy those shares of that owner. In Canada, that's not the case. The banks don't wanna hear. Banks, the banks don't wanna know. They want collateral. They want a mortgage on your house. Many people don't have a house, they don't have a condominium, they don't have any equity, but they want to participate in the ESOP. So until the federal government here takes a different view on ESOPs, it's not, not going to happen. happen. So you're, going to, you're going to talk about yeah. Ellis Don and you're going to talk about, you know, French's, French's mustard and French's ketchup. They're not many. You think about a way to get more people involved in the capitalist system and, Absolutely. and creating uh, their own net worth and, uh, and, and wealth and equality. That's, 
That's got to be one of the best the way. ways possible. That's the way there's been so much written on these stocks. I've been to conferences. I've heard speakers from the U.S., from Europe speak. It hasn't worked here yet. So we've lobbied the government on behalf of our association to no avail. All they've done is they've kept the cap, small business capital gains exemption, the 850, currently in place. Right. But that's under threat as well. Let me ask they you want to get rid of it. Let me ask you one last question. Yes. Um, you and I have talked about Evergrande yes. in, uh, in China. Um, and the news there is, is still bad. It's dire. Um, the, uh, we've got supply chain issues. Big. Um, inflation and interest rates historically have tracked each other, and today they're not. They're not. Inflation is over 5%. Interest rates are, what, you know, almost zero. Correct. Um, people are talking about uh, potentially four um, bank rate increases this year, and, and maybe it's 25 basis points a time, and so that would only add, you know, 100 basis points. So still nowhere close uh, to inflation. So you've got financial challenges with, uh, with Evergrande in China and maybe the whole real estate market, you've got supply chain problems, you've got wage inflation, you've got goods inflation, you've got um, unaffordable housing and, uh, and high house prices, you've got interest rates that are probably going up, may have to go up more. Um, more. Um, what's your bet on the market? Buy gold. <laughs> Seriously. I have no interest in Bitcoin. I don't believe in Bitcoin. I believe in what Warren Buffett has said. It's not going to end well. So all my colleagues that are buying Bitcoin and various cryptocurrencies, that's a place to stay away. Uh, gold is a good investment. Real estate. Buy real estate. Even though the cap rates are so low. Cap rates are low, but it's secure. It's there. I can touch it, feel it, see it. Buying a business is a lot riskier. And uh, so when you're talking about real estate, you're talking about residential real estate or commercial Any real estate? Any real estate. Okay, come on. Like uh, the, the real estate prices to... Um, uh, incomes, real estate prices to rents are at an all-time high, comparable to what they were in the United States in 2007 before the financial collapse. You don't think real estate's ready for a collapse? Real estate is ready for an adjustment, but, but many do not believe, and I believe that real estate, certainly within our jurisdiction, is going to continue to grow, is going to continue to expand. With 450,000 immigrants coming into uh, Canada. They're, they're looking and, for uh, property. a couple hundred thousand coming into Toronto. They don't want to rent, they want to buy. Yeah. So if they have to lever themselves to the teeth, they will buy. Prices will continue to rise. Mark Brekowski, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Really appreciate it. Brian, and thank you for having pleasure. me. It was fun. Congratulations on 35 years. I hope you get, you know, maybe not 35 more, <laughs> but, but, but several more. And, uh, and one of these days we should go and buy a business together. Absolutely. Sounds Let's do a deal. Let's good. do a deal. Let's do a deal. Thank That's you. it. Let's do a deal. If you want to get Mark, you just go to Mercantile M&A. Uh, Mark Wachowski on LinkedIn is the best way to get the guy. And if you're selling a business, this is the man for you. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Good night.